Today's a fun lecture because it's about graphs and everybody everybody likes graphs. So, <clears throat> all right, I don't know. For some reason, I have these recap slides. So we've already done quite a bit from the initial randomization stuff. Then we did this heavy hitters, this sublinear space heavy hitters. <coughs> Streaming algorithm, followed by, uh, last time we did this awesome hash table called linear probing. Um, and, and today, uh, we'll do uh, an algorithm for minimum cut, which is a problem you've probably seen before, but it's a standard graph algorithm, graph problem. And and possibly we'll talk about something called the Galton-Watson process. That comes towards the end. So, okay. Minimum cut. Here's a graph. It only has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, hopefully. I'm not even sure. It only has like 12 nodes. Okay, it's not a big graph. Your goal is to find a minimum cut in the graph. So that means you want to delete some edges so that not everyone is connected to each other. Just 12 nodes. What is the minimum cut of this graph? <coughs> Sorry, I'm dying. Yeah. Five, why five? Okay, so certainly one of these vertex cuts, like this is five, okay? That, was, that would isolate that one vertex from everybody else. Can anyone beat five? Go to find a minimum cut in the graph. You give up. Okay. So there is a cut of size two. Here are these two purple edges will actually separate the red part of the graph from the green. And if you're red, green, colorblind, yeah. Uh, so yeah, okay. It's fun to, to try to create these problems. Uh, what it points out is that even with n equals 12, it's like not that easy. Right? It's only a two edge cut. Okay, so so that's that's the goal. Is uh you're given some undirected graph and you want to delete the fewest number of edges so that the graph is no longer connected. So presumably the input's already connected, you can do BFS to check. And then of course you can do a weighted version where you have edge weights and you want to delete the minimum weight of edges. Okay, so in that example is kind of unweighted or all the weights are one. But more generally, you can have edge weights. So, okay. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> uh, who wants to propose an algorithm for minimum cut? We teach you guys a way to do minimum cut in our regular algorithms class. Yeah. Yeah, and so how would you apply max flow to this problem? Yeah. Yeah, so max flow min cut, right? So if I pick a source in a sink, I can find a minimum cut separating the source from the sink. Now I don't know which one, but well, we can just try a bunch, right? So, <clears throat> okay. So we can, you know, try all source sync pairs, run Ford Fulkerson or, or whatever, and get the minimum ST cut, and then I'll put the minimum of all the cuts, right? So whatever the min cut is, it separates some pair. So, and of course, the you know, which pair you pick matters. I guess if you picked S and T like this, then you won't get the minimum cut. You'll just get this particular ST cut. Um, but the right choice of S and T will do better. 
All right, so that's going to, you know, take uh, n choose two max flows, right? Can anyone do better, but within this general reduction to max flow framework? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you can fix T, the sink, I think I wrote fix S, but you can, you know, you can fix the source, it's on some side of the minimum cut, and then now you just have to guess one vertex on the other side. So that'll get you n max flows. Okay. And now the question is, uh, can you do better? Okay. Does anyone know what technically is the fastest running time for max flow right now? Yeah, so there actually now exists uh, an m to the one plus little o of one running time, but that's very complicated. Um, okay, let me ask a different question. That, that was an algorithmic question that we're used to. Here's sort of a different kind of question, maybe unusual. It's a more structural question, a math question. It's about uh, an absolute bound. So let's say you have a graph with uh, m edges and n vertices. Okay, and here's my question. How many minimum cuts could there be in a graph? And I want some kind of upper bound. No matter the graph, it's at most this many minimum cuts. And I'm giving you four choices. It could be constant. That also includes unique, right? Oh, there's always at most 10 or something. There's some constant. Polynomial. There's some polynomial function of n. There's always at most a polynomial number of cuts. Uh, Sub-exponential. So n to the log something. Maybe log to the 10n, which is log n to the 10th power. Uh, so it's not quite exponential, but it's, it's bigger than any polynomial. Or exponential. Yeah, clearly, that's an upper bound because there's only two to the n sets, and the cuts are defined by the subset. It's on each side. So somewhere between a constant and exponential. Okay. And uh, to give the impression of participation, I'm forcing you all to vote. So, uh, okay, so first, who's not going to vote? Okay, zero. Okay, who thinks that there's at most a constant number of minimum cuts in any graph? Okay, who thinks there's at most a polynomial number of minimum cuts in any graph? Okay, I'd say that's like, 62%. What about sub exponential? Okay, it's probably like. It's too late. Who thinks there's that most an exponential number? Okay. And then who didn't actually vote after all? And then who didn't vote and also didn't just admit to not voting? One, no vote. I have very good memory. Okay. Um, okay, so let me give... Uh, okay, so keep that in mind. We're going to come back to this question later. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest... Uh, Two different sort of absurd algorithms. You know, I put this in the category of silly algorithms. Um, uh, you know, maybe here is sort of a, a role model, but consider this algorithm where you're given some graph. And I'm just going to keep choosing edges in proportion to their edges. So if there's a uh, capacity, so if there's no weights, I'll just keep choosing edges until, and every time, uh, until like there's only one cut left in the graph where I didn't hit. Uh, that cut. So in other words, uh, you know, if I sample this edge, then any cut that's removed from, that includes this edge is now disqualified. Okay, so intuitively, if I had this like graph, where obviously this is the min cut, 
you're hoping you hit all of these edges before you hit this one. Okay. So the, the, the algorithm is like, oh, let me just keep sampling edges uh, until there can only be one cut that's not hit left, hit yet. Okay. Uh, an equivalent version. You know, what you can sort of think about is as you sample edges, you kind of build out like a, a forest of the sampled edges, right? And those are the connected components. So those connected components are like the cuts you've hit. You won't be able to break them anymore until you're left with just two components left. Okay, so this is the weighted version. If it was unweighted, imagine this. Just permute the edges randomly. So I'll go through all the edges one by one. And I'll keep like building out a spanning force. So if it's connecting two different components, I'll add it. If it's already connected, I'll just throw it out. Okay. Until I have only two components left, two components in the original graph, and I'll just say, oh, let's try this cut, you know, the edges that are missing. Okay. The weighted version would look like this. Um, or a different equivalent version for unweighted graphs is for every edge, sample a uniformly random weight between 0 and 1, and then build the minimum spanning tree. And then whatever's the last edge that you added that's the heaviest weight edge, remove it and look at those two components. Okay. All right. So I thought that we could simulate this one together. Who has a number generator ready? Random number generator <laughs> ready. Like maybe between 0 and 100 or something. So what I'll do is uh, I'm going to point to an edge and then uh, uh, and then I'll, I'll just I'll just uh, label it with a number. And I think we will do the left side first and the right side second and the middle edge last because that's the most dramatic. That's the edge. That's clearly the min cut, right? And what we're hoping is that is that the minimum spanning tree will kind of add the middle edge last. Then the algorithm would work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we'll see. So okay. So who, who's who's going to, I don't care. Okay, so look at this top edge. What's, uh, give me a number between 0 and 100. That's 25. Okay. And then here, 60. So these should be random, not arbitrary. Like, don't just shout out your favorite number. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, and then this, this one, 76. Okay, and then maybe this one, 7. And then uh, this one, 66. And then this one, really? OK. And then, and then this one, oh my. OK. <laughs> and then this one, one, OK. OK. Um, OK, now I'm going to go on the right. What about this one? 36, and what about this one? Uh, and then uh, what about this one? 20, and then what about this one? Okay, what about this one? Okay, uh, and then what about this one? And what about this one? 45? And then what about this one? Okay, don't tell me yet. All right, now what number does the middle one need to be for our algorithm to output? So we have to just build that minimum spanning tree, right? Uh, I guess this will be in the spanning tree. Uh, which one? I think it's labeled seven. Oh no, I see what you're saying. Yeah, are we missing it like in both both of them? Okay, okay, give me two more numbers. Twenty and forty. Okay, those are two missing ones. The bottom one is twenty-nine. I see my handwriting has undermined this experiment. 
Uh, no, which I, I think we have all of them, right? Well, how many numbers are up there and how many numbers should be up there? I start erasing these arrows. Uh, oh, I'm missing several on the left side. Good question. Oh, okay. Give me an idea. Okay, I think we need one for this outer edge then. Oh. Oh, I see. I just didn't do any of these top to bottoms. Okay. So this 61 was out here. Okay, I need two more numbers then for this edge. 81. And then 15 will go here. No, no, 76, 76 is the top bar. 24 is going from top to bottom. Uh, yeah. So that's in the spanning tree. 15. There's two 29s. Okay. Birthday paradox. Does that create a cycle? No, it doesn't. Um... The next edge is 36. Something like this. And 24. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so now everything's connected, right? Okay, so what number do we have to get in order for the middle edge to be the last edge in the MST? It should be bigger than something. What is something? Uh, so so seventy six is the is the one going diagonally down. Twenty four is going across. So it's really what's the biggest weight edge in the spanning tree? 29. So, so I think we just need to get a number that's bigger than 29 up to some arbitrary assignment of numbers to nearby edges. Okay. Well, I have it straight in my mind. So, okay. So we need to beat 29. Okay. We need one more number. Yeah. 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 Okay. We did it guys. I don't think we cheated. Um, so if you build out the MST, you will in fact get 59 in this particular example, and you will output this this edge. So one thing kind of nice, right? It's like, oh, we got this 98, and I thought we we're going to be screwed. But actually, 98 is canceled out by the rest of them being connected by smaller edges. So when you have these really like dense regions, you have many tries to get smaller numbers at some level. Okay, So you can sort of at least see some of the intuition behind the algorithm. That's really the point. Not, not meant to be a commentary about my handwriting. Um, okay, so, uh, so another way to think about this this algorithm is is you know whatever is the minimum weight edge, like it's this one or something, you're going to kind of think of it as one vertex from now on, right? As if you're building a spanning forest. So sometimes we call that uh, contracting an edge. So. By contracting an edge, like I sampled this edge between u and v, I'm going to take the two endpoints and turn it into one endpoint. And then that's going to create some parallel edges, you know, the, the endpoints they had in common or neighbors they had in common. And those will just sum up the weights. Okay, so you'll get something like this and see how the, the one and the two with the same endpoint, it collapsed into one edge of weight three. Okay, so. That's what I mean by contract. So the same thing as the spanning tree algorithm is, is I'll, I'll repeatedly sample an edge in proportion to its weight and I'll contract it. Sample an edge in proportion to its weight and contract it, right? Just like you're building out a spanning force. And uh, until you only have two vertices left, which underneath means you've built out a spanning tree on this component and built out a spanning tree on this component 
and that's the last edge of your, right? And then you'll return the edges that were cut. Yeah. Uh, the spanning tree thing. Uh, well, the, the so the spanning tree thing is um, so first of all, that particular thing is better for unweighted. And then if you wanted to figure out how to generalize the spanning tree algorithm for the weighted setting, then then like a weight two edge should should look like two edges that get two different numbers. Now, um, as far as why it's why it's similar to this, so so imagine. Uh, imagine I'm doing the spanning tree thing, and this is the smallest weight edge. Like if I do the thing where I choose them in some arbitrary order, or random order, I shouldn't say arbitrary, right? And so henceforth, that's, that's the first edge, and those two endpoints are gonna look like one vertex from now on, because they're definitely in my spanning forest. Now, we have sort of two candidates for this edge now. We effectively will have two parallel edges to here. So when I'm trying to figure out, oh, what's the next edge to stay at to a spanning forest, I should sort of have two tries at adding a connection from that blob to this vertex, which you could also think of just adding as weight, and I'm going to sample in proportion to weight. It's also like keeping unweighted and choosing one of the parallel copies out there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's this contraction algorithm, and I'm just going to keep contracting weights. This also makes sense if the input was already weighted. Um, so what, what would it look like? I carefully drew this out. So uh, like maybe you sample that edge first to contract. So that will get pinched down to something like this. Right, so now I have these edges of weight two because that used to be two underlying edges. And then, I don't know, I sample another one in the top right. That gets smaller, and I sample another one in the top left, like that. And and over time, you know, you keep sampling these edges, and the graph gets smaller and smaller. The numbers are just keeping track of how many parallel edges, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you're hoping you avoid sampling from the minimum cut until there's two vertices left. Okay. So that's that's the algorithm something like this. It's sort of a ridiculous algorithm, right? Okay. Um, okay, so now here's our question. We want to argue that this will sometimes produce the minimum cut. And we'll try to figure out what that sometimes is. So let's fix a particular minimum cut I'll call C star. I'm thinking that as a set of edges. And what is the probably that output C star? Okay, so, uh, I mean, one observation that might have been obvious but is good to establish is that if you sample an edge that's not in the minimum cut, right, if I like sampled this edge and the minimum cut was in the middle, this will still be the minimum cut in the resulting graph. Because in this contracted graph, any cut here kind of expands out to a cut in the original graph. So all the cuts in here are like only bigger than before. Okay, so as long as I avoid sampling C star, it remains a minimum cut. Maybe that's intuitively clear, but it's important to establish this. Okay, so, okay. so we're going to output C star only if every edge we sample is not in the cut. And we want to analyze the probability that this happens. And I'm letting lambda denote the, I guess I use capacity the weight of the minimum cut. If it's unweighted, that's the number of edges of the minimum cut. Okay. Okay, so it's very slick. Here's sort of the key lemma. So at some level, right, so the minimum cut has weight lambda, and I'm sampling from one of the edges out there. So I really want to argue that there's a lot of weight out there and that lambda is only a small fraction of the whole thing. Because if lambda was a large fraction, you just sample it, you're screwed, you're done, right? So that's what this is claiming. If I sum up all the edges, their capacities, it's at least like n times lambda divided by two. So it's some large number bigger than lambda, some, right? That's the claim. 
the total weight out there is at least a factor of n over 2 times the minimum cut. Right? So that means you only have like a 2 over n chance in one round of hitting it. Okay, but how do I prove this? Why is it the case that if I sum up all the edges or capacities, it's at least lambda n over 2? This is guessable. Lambda is the weight of the minimum cut. Why is the total weight of all edges at least n over 2 times the minimum cut? Yeah. Oh. Oh, no, that was a fake. Okay. Pump fake. Yeah. Yeah, what is the minimum degree in the graph relative to lambda? It's at least a min cut. So each vertex itself represents a cut, right? So the minimum degree is at least lambda. So the sum of degrees is at least n lambda, and y divided by 2? We're double counting every edge. So uh, that's it. Uh, I guess the, the, this is supposed to be weighted, so I'll write C in the corner, uh, and this is at least lambda n over 2. Okay, so a pretty simple observation. Okay. The total weight out there is always actually much bigger than the minimum cut. So while I drew a graph that obviously this algorithm might make intuitive sense for, some of that intuition would apply to any graph. Okay, so that's really the one quick lemma we need. Now, ultimately, I want to argue uh, that the probability of sampling an edge is at most 2 over n. Okay. Oh, wait, no, this is, this is easy. Okay, so if I'm sampling in proportion to the weight, then in turn, the odds that for one round, that edge comes from C star is at most 2 over n. Okay, so lambda is, you want to avoid lambda weight. There's at least lambda n over 2 weight out there. So lambda divided by lambda n over 2 will get you 2 over n. Okay, so that's good. So any round, like if n's really big, you're definitely surviving the first round. You're definitely surviving the second round. It gets trickier over time, though, as n gets smaller and you need to get on a streak, right? You have to win every round. That's when things start to get complicated. OK. OK, so now let's go to this uh, claim that uh, we really wanted. So uh, one sec, let me bring this with us. This will be useful. Uh, so now, ultimately, let's go to our original claim, which is that I'm going to return a particular cut with probability 1 over n choose 2. At least that's what I'm going to try to show. That's my claim. Okay. Um, not sure why there's a 2 here. Okay, we'll find out the 2 is correct. So to, to set up this proof, what I'm going to do is, is try to iteratively analyze Oh, what are the odds of surviving after one round, after two rounds, after three rounds, after four rounds? Okay. So, uh, so E sub K is the event that C has not been sampled after K rounds. And I really want to show that after N minus two rounds, at which point there's two vertices left, you know, what are the odds of that happening? Because those are the odds of returning the minimum cut. And I guess the claim is that it's at least two over N choose two. It might be 1 over n choose 2. I don't think the 2 is supposed to be there, but we'll find out when we do the calculations. Okay, okay. so I want to analyze E sub n minus 2. Um, any idea how to get this going, how to get this started?
or okay, E sub n minus two seems hard, right? What's a different E sub k? What value of k is pretty easy? One, I bet there's one even easier than one. Uh, zero, okay, so E sub zero just always happens, right? After zero rounds, you haven't sampled. And we figured out how to do E sub one, right? Which is uh, two over n. All right, how would I do E sub two? We can, yeah, we can try the conditioning over E sub one. So if we did slowly, so if E sub two happened, then E sub one had to happen first, right? So instead of asking for events two and events one, I mean, event two by itself, if I said, oh, what are the odds that event two and event one happen? Because event two implies event one, the probability doesn't change. If event two happened, definitely event one happened. So, and here, this is just kind of slowly showing you where conditional probabilities would come from. Then it would be, okay, what is the probability of E sub two happening given E sub one did happen times the probability that E sub one happened? Okay, so that's how I would do it slowly. And we know this, this is two over N. Now, what about this? should also be 2 over n. n minus 1. So the number of vertices went down. So we just reapply the lemma to the new graph, and it's still the minimum cut in the new graph. So you still get 2 over n minus 1. And that's just an upper bound. Okay. So you can imagine doing that for large, large ones. So this will also expand out to e n minus 2 given n minus 1. Uh, sorry, n minus 3. n minus 3 given n minus 4. And so forth, all the way down to probability of e1 at the end. Okay. And so we should get something like, oh, this is... 2 over n times 2 over n minus 1 times 2 over n minus 2, dot, dot, dot. What would be the first term? Is it 2 over 3? Okay, so uh, right. Oh, but did I screw something up? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Sure. Otherwise, it was going to look really bleak. Uh. Okay, this is, uh, something like this. Okay, and now if I start looking at these terms, this will look like n minus 2 over n, n minus 3 over n minus 1 n minus 4 over n minus 2 all the way about down to 1 over 3 okay and then in a nicer mathy notation this is like n factorial with 2 factorial up here n minus 2 factorial One over n choose two. So that should have been a one after all. All right. So so doing this conditional probability. Okay, so you get this one over n choose two. Okay, good. Okay, let's go back to this question. I claim we now know the answer to this. 
Uh, maybe I could take another vote. All right, so who now thinks it's a constant number of minimum cuts? Okay, still zero. Who now thinks it's a polynomial? Okay, I think it's gone up. Who thinks it's sub-exponential? And who thinks it's exponential? Okay. So that means this lecture has killed off like 17% <laughs> has died. Okay. Uh, okay. So many of people said polynomial. Why? How do, why did we just show that there's at most a polynomial number of cuts? That is the right answer. We have actually kind of quietly shown that there's at most a polynomial number of minimum cuts. So what happened? Yeah. Yeah, so we fixed the single minimum cut and said, oh, this algorithm is going to return this minimum cut it was probably 1 over n choose 2. That must apply to all the minimum cuts. And all those probabilities can add up to only one because the algorithm only returns one cut, right? So somehow we've indirectly um, shown that there's at most n choose 2 minimum cuts in the graph, right? It's a remarkable fact. It actually has a lot of algorithmic consequences, okay? But it's unbelievable, right? That, that's, I mean, because undirected graphs, you would think there's, they're so arbitrary, right? Like, you can connect anything in a graph. It doesn't seem that structured. But this is saying, oh, there's actually quite a lot of symmetry. You know, if you're worried about preserving the minimum cut, you really need to focus on the end choose two minimum cuts and stuff like this. Uh, we'll explore some of the consequences maybe in some homeworks or later lectures, but this is just like an unbelievable fact. Okay. All right, so if you're clever, you can do one pass of this algorithm in linear time, for example, by doing the minimum spanning tree style thing, at least up to log factors. Uh, but we only succeed with probability one over error n squared or something, right? Because that's if there's only one min cut or something. So how many times should I rerun it to guarantee high probability of success? So in general, if, if something has a probability one in a hundred of succeeding, roughly how many times do I need to try again to get even a constant factor of success? About a hundred. And this is just because, you know, in general, one minus one over k, those are the odds of failing every single time. Uh, to the k, this is approximately e to the minus one. Okay. And so, if I repeat this n choose two times with constant probability, I get a min cut. So that's like your coin that flips heads with probability, you know, one half. And now if I wanted to get the high probability, how many times do I need to repeat that? You're going to throw in another log factor. Okay. And now to get your, your you know, polynomially small error probability. So at that point, you're just flipping coins. Okay, good. A little more time. All right, so the question is, can you do better? Okay. So, so at some level, can you do better than just retrying everything from the beginning? Any intuitive ideas? So I have an analogy, and every year I wonder if this is like officially too old to use this. So, so this is what game? Okay. So, uh, and who is who's the character on top? Ian? Is that what you said? I think his name is Lance. Anyway, he's the final boss, right? So you play this Pokemon game for like uh, ever, and then you get to the final boss. And what do you do when you meet the final boss? No. No. You, you save, right? You save the game. 
you save the game so if you lose you can just restart it right so this is what you're supposed to do you save the game right and uh and so that's what we're going to consider so instead of like running the algorithm all the way through and then trying again all the way through what if we ran it for a while press pause right and then maybe branched it so i'll make two copies of my intermediate progress and then keep those two running and then maybe branch that or something so so that's what we're going to do so we're going to calculate how many rounds i can go until my probability of success is about one half because initially the probability of success is super high right but after a number of rounds, it starts to get worse and worse. We'll figure out roughly what reaches one half. And at that one half point, I'm going to take my graph and make two copies. And I'm going to let them both run and then do this recursively. Okay, so uh, as a diagram, you know, you might run it for a while until something like this. And then you're going to fork it and let it run for another while. And then you're going to fork it. And you're going to hope that one of those kind of offspring returns the minimum cut. So that'll end up producing a bunch of cuts and you just return the best one you find. Okay, so maybe that's better than starting completely over. Okay, so that's that's the high level algorithm. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is in pseudocode, but it's not very interesting. And so we're gonna try to argue that if I did it this way, uh, where I really run it until I get that halfway, probably one half error, and then I fork, then you'll still get roughly one over log n probably success. So then you only have to repeat like log n times, uh, or two log n, you know, log n squared times to get high probability. Um, so to, to argue this, we're going to need the following fact, which we'll prove at the end, and it'll probably be rushed. Okay. But this is something that like, uh, uh, population scientist, statistician might study when they study like populations and whether they'll grow or they'll perish. So this is a simple model. You imagine you have a, tr a tree and each time it, it has up to two children, but each child is probability one half. So it's possible that like was one fourth probability there's no children and the population dies. Okay. And the question is, okay, what are the odds that some thing survives after 10 generations, 100 generations, so forth. And then you can play with the probabilities differently. Oh, what if there's up to three children, each was probability one half and stuff like this. So they play with different parameters. So I'm looking at a particular symmetric case where I have a complete binary tree. I mean, I mean, I have a binary and each edge appears as probability one half. And I want to know what are the odds that I survive, somebody survives after K generations. Another way to look at that is imagine drawing the binary tree ahead of time with level K. And now delete every edge with probability one half. What are the odds I can get from the root to a leaf, any leaf at all? Okay, so this is called a Galton Watson process. Presumably they studied this. Um, and so in this particular case, when you have when the branch factor is equal to that probability of dying, so the expectation is like one in each generation, then we're gonna show that if you're doing k levels, then your probability is at least one over k. Uh, and why that's relevant is uh, for our algorithm, we're running it until it gets down to probability one half and then forking. Yeah. No, we'll just start with one at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Um, and I'll, I won't do this calculation slowly, but if you, in general, you know, we didn't have to go all the way to the end. We could have gone to until there's K edges left for some K or something. And if you work it out, then if you had gone until there's roughly N over square root two edges, then you'll guarantee if this probability one half. Okay, and this is just the exact same calculations as before and just plugging something in. You can see K squared over N squared, right? So, so it turns out that you can get rid of a one over square root two factor of your nodes and survive with probability one half. Okay. So, okay, so, so for us, that's gonna be like those, those branches of the tree, 
the, the probability one half of succeeding is one of these clones surviving. And now we just have to figure out the height, right? And, and since you're always getting rid of a square root two fraction, Right, so each time the size goes down by square root two, square root two, square root two. So you only need log n rounds, right? Sometimes some constant, just like binary search and stuff. Uh, so your probability of success is at most is at least one over log n. So that's where the log n is coming in from, coming from. Okay. Um, okay, we can briefly try to do the running time analysis. It has to be very brief. So then we can start seeing why this might pay off. Okay, so you know you have a root problem of size n. I always do recurrence trees. You should always do recurrence trees, right? You have two subproblems of size n over square root two, and then these are problems of size n over two. And the work you're doing at each level is n squared, right? So at the top level, I'm doing n squared work. At the second level, I have n squared over two times two. So that's also n squared. At the, at the next level, I have n squared over four times four, n squared. So each level, if you work it out, you're doing n squared work. And there's log n levels. So you're doing n squared log n times. Why n squared is because in the contracted graph, there's at most n squared edges. Okay. Same thing. Okay. So here's now the probabilistic analysis that remains. So if you can just analyze this sort of population model, then everything's done. Okay. So we'll go quickly. All right. And this one is sort of tricky. So, okay. What we're going to do is I'm going to say, okay, what is, uh, I'm going to let P sub I be the probability that a particular node at level I has a path to the root. I think this is to the root. I don't know how I counted it because I counted it like three years ago. Okay. So, uh, Wait, how did I do this? One sec. Uh, I'm a little confused by how I described this. Oh, no. so I'm, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, I've confused myself. What the hell does that mean? Probability that a particular node at level I has path to a subleaf. What does that mean? Oh, okay, so maybe levels from the bottom. Okay, okay, I think you're right. Okay, good, you saved the day. Ken from three years ago, I've traveled through time to thank you. Um, okay, so, so I'm looking at a node at level I plus one, okay? And it has two children, right? And these children have a probability PI of making it to the bottom. And so I only fail if, uh, so I fail if, 
for each of these, uh, I either delete the edge or I keep the edge and I have PI plus one. Okay, so maybe we can just interpret the equation. So, so this is coming from the two children. So it's one minus the probability of it not happening. So one half is edge to the, one of these one halves is edge to that child just died. And otherwise one half, the edge is there, but then that child didn't survive. Okay, and then one minus that squared. And then you get one minus one minus pi squared, so you get this. Okay, I'm glad we're gonna survive. We'll be a little late. And I work through the first couple exactly. Okay. So the claim uh, what we ultimately wanted to show is that p sub k is at least one over k. That means like height 10 has probably at least one over 10. Height log n is probably one over log n. Okay. And okay, this is a little analytical and we're over time, so maybe I'll just go quickly and hit the main points and you can all conscientiously go back and study this. Okay. So, so the key point in analyzing this, you know, let's look at this function. P of f of x is at least, is x times one minus x over four. Okay. And it's important to point out that this quantity is increasing for x at most two. Okay. Cause it's not, I mean, cause you have the negative x. So it could go up, it could go down, but the, this is really an increasing function for the regime we're interested in. And because pi is between zero and one. So uh, consequently, we can write p sub k plus one is equal to pi times one minus pi over four. But since it's increasing, I can replace p sub k with its lower bound by induction, or p sub i with its lower bound by induction. P sub, so you get one over k times one minus one over four k. And then you just work through this. And notice it's at least one over k plus one. And that would be this calculation down here. Sorry? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Okay. So this should be at least squared and equal to, and then you'll walk away with the bound you're looking for. Okay, so you, I just did it by induction. I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but. That's one way to do it. You do need to point out that this function is increasing in the regime of interest so that you can replace this bound with another. Okay, so that's it. That's done. That'll get you the Galton-Watson process. That'll get you this faster algorithm, and that's all I had today. Okay, thanks, guys.